All right. Um, welcome, everybody, both in the room and on Zoom. Uh, thanks for joining us for today's RSM Speaker Series event. Um, social media regulation is very much back in the news with the TikTok divester ban bill. Um, so we're really lucky to be joined uh, today by an amazing duo who will be discussing some private law approaches to social media governance, which have received considerably less attention in public discourse. Um, Galad Mills is a doctoral student here at Harvard Law School. His research explores the relationship between social media platforms, their users, and the public as a whole. It aims to outline a new private law fairness doctrine that requires social media platforms to duly weigh individual and public interests in the course of their business. Uh, some of his work is forthcoming in the Yale Law and Policy Review, which we're really excited to hear about today. And in conversation with the law is Professor Martha Minow, who needs no introduction. Professor Minow is the 300th anniversary, anniversary uh, university professor and former dean of Harvard Law School. She's an expert in human rights and advocacy for members of racial and religious minorities and for women, children, and persons with disabilities. She also writes extensively and teaches about digital communications, democracy, privatization, military justice, and ethnic and religious conflict. And we're really lucky to have her uh, joining us today. Um, so I hope you'll join me in welcoming today's guests. And with that, I'll pass it over to Galad, who will be presenting a few slides. Um, thank you uh, so much for the introduction, um, and thank you, for Professor Mino, for uh, joining me in this discussion um, and for the support throughout this project. And I want to thank the Berkman Klein Center for the opportunity to present this work here. Um, as you all know, the Berkman Klein Center deals with um, a variety of issues concerning um, digital technology, AI, social media, and their uh, intersection with law and society uh, more generally. Uh, so preparing for this event, I uh, decided to take uh, a, to take a short look at uh, previous events uh, here at the Berkman Klein Center, um, and I try to classify the discussions uh, by whether they offer a public law perspective or approach uh, to uh, tech governance, whether they are more neutral in that respect, or uh, have a private law perspective on the issues. So this is by no means a rigorous analysis. It's just me trying to give some indication as to what how the discourse looks like. And I think uh, it kind of tells something true. Uh, so 16 events were about public law. 13 were neutral. That is more descriptive about the technology and the industry. And three were kind of had a private law aspect to them. Um, and I think I might be a little generous here because two of them were about like a panel with multiple participants that I, that I believe some private relations were discussed there. And the one remaining is this talk. So if, even though it's not uh, a lot in the news, I hope to prove to you today that uh, private law actually has a lot to contribute um, to, this to these discussions. Um, and especially can be used as a complementary tool to public law approaches uh, when they may be insufficient. Before we start, just a quick, uh, so we can be on the same page about what do I mean when I say public law versus a private law uh, approach to governance. Um, so when I say public law, I mean uh, proposals uh, that are using bodies of law such as constitutional, administrative, international human rights law, etc. Uh, they focus on the vertical relationships between the state and the individual, and talk a lot about the limitations of state action in that, in the context of these relationships. Uh, they are basically premised on public action, that is they require a governmental agency or the legislature to step in and uh, do something to regulate the market. And famous examples that many of you are probably familiar with, the DSA, the GDPR, etc. When I say private law, <laughs> I refer to uh, ideas focusing on contract law, tort law, property law, etc., dealing with horizontal relationship and the interpersonal norms within these relationships. And uh, it is, they are premised on private action, that is, individual, individuals taking their claims to courts and litigating them in order to vindicate their rights. And an example could be a, a court finding X liable for a breach of contract after failing to take down terrorist content. So 
when we're looking at social media governance, um, the current literature uh, typically uh, takes uh, the following structure. It starts from imagining platforms as state-like entities, um, that is, it could be like legislatures or uh, administrative agencies or the administrative st states. Many offer that platforms actually act in the capacity of judges um, when they, adju and they adjudicate dispute disputes between parties. Um, and based on these analogies, certain obligations can be derived. Um, obligations that are rooted in public law thought and uh, terminology. For example, they draw on human rights law, they draw on digital, they propose digital constitutionalism, the rule of law, etc. all sorts of public law ideas. And I think a common thread with, between all these um, proposals is that they focus on trying to protect users' expectations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, digital social media platforms, which might abuse their superior power. But I argue that this discourse, to an extent, is trapped in a certain dichotomy. To regulate or not to regulate, a lot of the discussion is whether self-governance uh, is superior to direct regulation, and um, they are trying to find solutions to these problems. Um, and I think uh, private law has something to offer us. So instead of imagining uh, platforms as state-like entities, I, I offer imagining them as private corporations performing contractual obligations under the rules of contract law, where our goal would also be to protect users' expectations um, um, in this relationship. I argue that uh, holding platforms liable for failing to uphold contractual commitments could actually yield the very purpose um, public law solutions are trying to, uh, to, come, to come up with, which is promoting accountability, um, while also, also avoiding direct regulation or strict reliance on self-governance. Why a contractual approach? Um, I think this can offer us several advantages compared to public law approaches. Uh, first, it can avoid certain constitutional barriers, um, since the First Amendment uh, bars state action in uh, trying to regulate speech, uh, whereas it allows uh, parties in a contract to uh, self-impose uh, restrictions on, uh, on uh, speech, and the court and courts can enforce that. Um, it can avoid political deadlock. That is, we are not dependent anymore on political action. Rather, we are empowering individuals to bring their claims for, uh, to courts and adjudicate, uh, trying to vindicate their rights. It proposes dynamism and contextuality. Uh, because post, um, ex post adjudication can uh, tailor specific solutions to questions that come up. Um, and the last thing I think, which I think is also important, it has a very distinct moral underpinning. Um, while speech uh, regulation might be around whether speech is good or bad, contract law regulation would be around whether platforms actually upheld their promises or lied to us. And this moral disdain is easier to be translated into legal, a legal response for several reasons, which we can talk about later. The point is that a private law approach or a contract law approach can complement public law solutions or even substitute them when they are either inappropriate, insufficient, or simply unattainable. Now, when we're talking about social media contracting, and this is a second layer this project proposes, um, we need to start by understanding what this contractual arrangement looks like. And for this, we need to dispel a few misperceptions that I think had some actual bearing in real world case law and have affected, I think, some of the scholarship in the field. The first thing is to start by saying that the terms of service are not the, con the contract as a whole. Rather, the contract absorbs norms and expectations through various devices that platforms are using uh, in order to convey their intentions, such as community guidelines, 
Privacy policy uh, policies which regulate the use of data. Internal policy guidelines which actually affect what the service looks like. That is what rights the user, users have when they are using the platforms. News releases, public announcements, these, these uh, expectations or these norms and obligations are embedded within the code. That is, the code dictates what the service is. And sometimes they are even posted by uh, CEOs of such platforms. Another misconception um, is about the contracts elements, uh, which I think is a very important uh, thing to put on the table when we're trying to analyze this relationship. The, the elements of the contracts with, which I show in this project uh, are focused on the service, the standard of liability, and the consideration. Starting from the service, if you've listened to the hearing, uh, the last hearing in the Supreme Court about the net choice cases, you could see that the judges are struggling to define what social media actually is. I'm trying to do some work in that area, even though there is some literature around that already. For example, uh, Gillespie uh, offered that moderation is the essence of platforms, it is the commodity they actually offer. Whether it's true or completely accurate or just almost accurate, it's practically irrelevant for our, uh, for our uh, legal analysis because content moderation is certainly very central in the, product, pro in the product or the service, which means that expectations created around or representations around content moderation are part of the material attributes of the service provided to users. And therefore, when platforms fail to uphold these commitments, they are actually committing a breach of contract to an extent. Why to an extent? Because platforms don't actually commit to providing a certain result into, uh, as, uh, to their content moderation. They practically can't do that. They can't promise us that there will be no hate speech on the platform. Rather, they promise to make their best efforts in actually enforcing their policies. Um, why? Because this is inherently based on discretionary performance. Platforms must use their discretion when they are moderating. And the, the, the mistakes are practically inevitable because of the, um, the scope and the pace of moderation decision making. We can expect, no one expects platforms to be 100% safe and platforms never commit to doing that. The final uh, element is the consideration which is also very important because it's, it has a unique structure when you're looking at uh, consumer transactions because it is based on data and attention rather than monetary remuneration. And I think this is a very important aspect. It is not a service provided for free, a mistake that I think courts have made in the past, which led to certain, I think, inaccurate results in terms of legal doctrine. What is important is to understand this arrangement as a unified whole. That is, we can't disentangle, we can't disentangle the elements from each other. We can't understand, understand what the service is without understanding the standard of liability. That is what is a breach. And we can't understand it without understanding its relationship to the consideration in this context, uh, which is a kind of a cycle data and attention are feeding the service as it goes. We can't disentangle that and I think some of the uh, scholarship in the field have tried to disentangle and brought some solutions that are problematic. What, another thing that we can understand by putting these together is that this is actually an ongoing barter in which data and attention are traded for the service. Uh, both are not fungible. They are uniquely tailored to the specific consumer um, and are very much in divergence from tra traditional consumer contracts. And this divergence, I argue, warrants a similar divergence in the way the law is applied in this context. But do we need to develop new tools in order um, to actually address this divergence, or does contract law actually has, or have already such tools? And let me keep you in suspense. The answer is that I think that such tools already exist in relational contract theory, ne needing some adaptation, uh, certainly, but they exist, they are there. Actually, relational contract theory developed precisely to address this type of divergence. 
When it started uh, to, be, to develop in the second half of the 20th century, it focused on the divergence between what was the paradigmatic contract on which contract law was established, which was the discrete contract. Um, this is a contract that is isolated. Uh, it has no past and fu or future relationship between the parties, like going to a market and purchasing a tomato, let's say, or a pig, fat pig. Uh, However, most contracts, or not most, many contracts do not share similar attributes and they are relational. That is, the relationship between the parties actually uh, creates a lot of norms and expectations that creep into the contractual arrangements and actually move what, what is going on between the parties. Famous examples are producer-distributor relationship, writer-publisher relationship, etc in which the relationship is ongoing, it is dynamic and adaptive, it is often very complex, and it is often premised on, premise on trust between the parties. These relational contracts have a certain structure to them that we can see uh, as a typical structure. They are incomplete contracts designed to support lo a long-term relationship. They require dynamic adaptations. They are manifesting interdependence in producing joint sur surplus, that is a strict division of labor between the parties. And they offer complex contract governance, that is all the procedures and rules uh, for administering the, the contract itself. From these stem certain norms and expectations that are typical of relational contract, such as a norm of cooperation, and the norm of attempts to preserve the relationship rather um, than trying to uh, profit immediately and end the relationship when such profit is made. They are premised, like I said, on trust and solidarity, on fair balancing of interests, and they often include values such as human dignity, distributional uh, justice, equity, equality, sorry, and procedural uh, fairness. And I want to say, that if all this sounds familiar, there's a reason. Because I argue that all of this are actually appearing in social media contracting. These are incomplete contracts. They are designed to support long-term interaction, where users actually build their, inter their uh, virtual profile and start creating content. They require necessarily dynamic adaptations. They, we see platforms trying constantly to induce users' trust, and they are trying to say that they are acting in solidarity and they actually care about the public interests and users' interests. This is not by coincidence. This is because this is the way the contract is structured. It's inevitable. And indeed, David Hoffman find a few, found already a few years ago qualitative, qualitative empirical evidence. He went and did some interviews with uh, social media personnel and lawyers and learned from them that when they drafted the contract, this is exactly what they were trying to achieve. He called this a relational contract of adhesion. I don't think this uh, term is necessary, but it's not very important. What is important is that these findings were actually inevitable. This is how the contract is structured. Okay, so now when we go to uh, a contractual approach to social media governance, and we're trying to say, well, file a lawsuit and try to vindicate your right, we have platform immunity, right? So what do we do about that? So first we have statutory immunity, shielding platforms from liability. And what I argue in this respect is that Section 230 does not foreclose contractual claims. Rather, it is designed to foreclose tort-based claims. As the court in Zeran said, this is a seminal case uh, articulating the, inter the interpretation of Section 230 that lives until this day. Congress recognized the threat that tort-based liability or lawsuits would pose to freedom of speech. And they argue, the court argued that this would be simply another uh, form of intrusive government regulation on speech. But as you can see, this is tort liability, not contract. Because contract liability has different characteristics to it. It is first and foremost respectful of the voluntarily adopted speech norms that the parties uh, committed themselves to. And this is, like I said, does not trigger the same constitutional concerns 
like imposing tort liability on some, uh, based on some idea of reasonableness. Furthermore, the question of incentives, as the court mentioned correctly in Zeran, tort liability would create a one-sided incentive to take down content that might harm people. However, contract liability would not create such a, a one-sided incentive, but rather would aim at protecting both contractual rights of speakers and contractual, right, contractual rights of listeners, and that, what, and that is why the incentive would be towards upholding your contractual commitments, rather than just taking down content as much as you can. And I think the basic point here is that Section 230 was never legislated in order to give social media platforms a right to mislead their uh, users about what they are actually doing and um, make a lot of profits based on that. Another barrier could be contractual immunity, that is limitations on liability clauses, but I also offer solutions to that to invalidate these clauses based on unconscionability, good faith, and public policy. We can talk about, more, uh, about this more in the discussion if we would like. So now, after all this, coming to some direct implications. So we talked about relational contract theory, and there's a challenge moving from theory to doctrine, and I'm trying to address this challenge in the paper. And the first step is to define the legal duty. What does um, a relational contract in this case mean? And the way to go about this is to focus on platforms' best efforts commitments. Contract law has very specific doctrine to address this type of commitment, and it says that people who commit themselves to making the best efforts in performance actually mean fairness and diligence. Fairness here is utmost good faith, or uh, more stringent good faith, or something of this sort. Um, some can call it limited loyalty. A duty of loyalty means that a party is completely loyal to the other. That is, he has only the other's interest in mind. But for platforms, such a duty would be problematic, uh, because we accept that platforms have their own interest in the, in the deal, but what we expect them to do is to equitably balance interests. Which interests? Their own interest in profit, users' interests, such as safety, reputation, etc., and the public interest as a whole. That is public safety, speech, the, uh, protecting the speech environment, protecting the democratic resilience, etc. All this is most likely sounding very familiar to you, because this is what platforms actually say they are doing repeatedly. They are protecting the public safety. They are protecting users from harassment, etc. They are protecting their own interest in profit. And I brought an example. This is Elon Musk tweeting not too long ago, explaining what X actually does. Above everything, including profit, X works to protect the public's right to free speech. Okay, he is implying we are balancing, we are balancing our interests in uh, profit against the interests of the public to a right to free speech, and this juxtaposed with other statements made by Twitter regarding its um, work, we can see that this is also um, balanced against other uh, other interests. So. Our team continues its diligent work to keep the platform safe from hateful conduct, abusive behavior, and, and any violation of Twitter's rules. When they are committing to acting diligently, I take that as a promise. Right? They are telling me that they are working properly. But what is diligent? What does it mean? So the next thing would be to start deriving from these very general duties of diligence and fairness some specific obligations that we can start uh, prescribing. The first thing I think which is quite an easy derivative to make is that to say that they have affirmative an affirmative duty to consider, that is, they have to consider users' interests, they have to consider the public interest, and so, for example, they can't act arbitrarily, just take down my content because they like to, okay? For example, they can't, uh, they can't inflict disproportionate harm neither on the public or on specific users when pursuing their uh, profit. Furthermore, we can start thinking about procedural mandates. Professor Van Lundy wrote a lot about procedural mandates, and 
I'm offering a way to, for courts to actually impose such mandates through the uh, platform's duty of diligence and fairness, that, to which they commit themselves. themselves. Furthermore, we can start thinking of systemic consideration, how this entire system is structured. Is this going to uh, uh, uphold their commitment of fairness and diligence? This is a question that, a question that courts, courts can start looking into and examining what they are actually doing. And I think another suggestion here is that it actually provides a legal hook for enforcing human rights commitments that platforms make. And I think this is also important because some scholars have been struggling to show why platforms actually have to do this, why we can impose this duty on them. And I bring an option, I think, that so far hasn't been used. Finally, some cautionary remarks. Of course, this is not a perfect solution. No solution is perfect. But specifically, we need to think about institutional limitations of courts. Uh, for example, they're dealing with a specific case. They are re reactive rather than proactive. Um, so it's hard for them to consider the public uh, interests or collective interests. These are open texture standards uh, that might create some uncertainty in the market. What do uh, platforms actually have to do? And that this might bring about judicial encroachment on, on platforms' decision making, which is also very concerning. And for this, I offer a few solutions. We have for uh, dealing with collective interests, we can think about class sections. But beyond that, we can start thinking about what should be the standard of review. That is, we need a differential standard of review. We need platforms to have the breathing space. They need to actually do what they act, they believe is enforcement of their own uh, uh, policies without intervention, unless in extreme situations. And for that, I offer a platform judgment rule, which takes from the business judgment rule uh, to an extent, and we can talk about it, this more uh, uh, later. And I offer a specific remedial approach that prioritizes equitable remedies, that is mostly injunctions that are focused on maintaining the relationship and just correcting mistakes rather than compensating uh, uh, specific users for, or a collective user or groups for damages they incur, because we understand that damages are inevitable in this situation because mistakes will happen, but we want mistakes to be corrected. Unless if the plaintiff can produce evidence that show that platforms acted in bad faith or in gross negligence, I think damages might be appropriate to cover for the deterrence gap. And to finish, I think the paper offers several uh, novel contributions. It examines private law's, private law's role in social media governance, uh, provides a comprehensive contractual analysis that I think was missing from the literature. Uh, it provides a novel approach for employing relational contract theory in this context, revisits platform immunity for, from contractual claims, offers doctrinal solutions such as imposing fairness and diligence, a differential standard of review, and uh, a certain distinct remedial approach. And with that, we'll pass to the discussion. Thank you very much. and important contribution, I want to start by asking about the moral argument. You said the moral argument is uh, better than talking about good and bad. So why, and explain more. And this is only about promises, or is there something else going on? I think, uh, let's talk about uh, Kate Klonick's famous uh, New Governor's piece, where she where she, uh, she held interviews with the social media personnel and found what, what is actually moving their uh, behavior. She found that uh, social media personnel is uh, very American in his First Amendment approach. She found that they are moved by uh, social responsibility ideals. And she found that uh, they are interested in reputation, good reputation. Uh, 
What is missing here is that they should be moved, I believe, by trying, but the uh, moral uh, command to uphold their promises. And the fact that they are not, I think, has to do with the fact that we are not thinking about whether they are actually misleading us when they are uh, um, uh, operating the systems. And I think uh, putting this on the table could be very uh, influential in the ways they are actually working. And furthermore, I think it's easier to translate that into legal uh, action or legal, a legal response because we don't want to impose ideas of social responsibility or goods uh, kind of preventing obscenity from being in the uh, market of ideas, but rather we are fine with imposing just a, a requirement to uphold your prom promises. So this is why I think this is kind of an important aspect. To yes, the... no, it's, it's both more operational and in many ways it actually takes the companies at their word. They say this is what they want to be and as you pointed out, reputation matters to them a great deal. If I just can add something, I think that they are actually very much using this idea that this is the promise we make. We, can, we saw that in their pleadings uh, in Gonzales, for example. They started out by saying, what do you mean we support terrorism with our algorithms? We have strict policies and we regularly enforce them uh, to take down terrorist content. Okay, so we failed here or there, but the fact that they commit themselves to it kind of shows the world who they are. And now, let's say, okay, if you are saying that to a court of law, right, you should uphold that. That would be judicial estoppel or something like that, right? We want them to keep their promise. One thing that I really admire in your effort is that you really dig down into what does this mean doctrinally. So for a moment, let us talk doctrinally. To define the duty in terms of best efforts uh, and to translate best efforts in turn into fairness and diligence, is there anything that's uh, actually specific with regard to amount of effort, uh, time, or comparative in a sector, in an industry, what's the reasonable standard of investment? Yeah, so I think, first of all, from the case law on best efforts, it's not, I haven't seen a lot of that, of that in consumer contracts context. Um, nonetheless, it has to do clearly with uh, industry norms um, that needs to be uh, understood. Um, and I think that through the process of litigation, that could be exposed by parties bringing evidence about how this typically works and what technologies um, are there out there to help us uh, in our efforts and whether they are implemented or not. For example, if Elon Musk says, we are not using algorithms to moderate, that could be a, a reason to suspect that they're not performing the, uh, their um, duty diligently. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, there are issues about whether it's only big platforms then that can comply as opposed to new or startup, but we can handle that maybe. But another doctrinal question is what do you really mean by platform judgment rule? Okay, so here I borrowed a concept from uh, corporate law about business judgment rule that. What it does is basically insulating platforms' decision making from uh, insulating platforms' good faith decision making from um, judicial intervention, and basically provides them immunity unless the plaintiff can bring some evidence suggesting that the, this presumption of good faith can be rebutted. So uh, it is similar in corporate law when you want to protect a director from liability. Um, and actually, I think it has similar ration, rationales. You don't want uh, to replace, you know, courts don't have expertise in content moderation. Um, we acknowledge that some risk is necessary, and we acknowledge that users accept a risk here, um, that content moderation won't be perfect, just like shareholders accept that some risks would be inevitable. And actually, protecting directors would allow the market to uh, succeed, just like protecting uh, platforms decision making would allow social, the social media like the debate
to uh, be handled more freely. So I think there are a lot of comparisons to make here. Uh, I would say that there, are, there is some literature suggesting that this should be kept strictly to fiduciary relationship. This raises, raises several questions. Uh, specifically, uh, we know, for example, we have Balkins and Zitrain's idea of information fiduciaries, uh, uh, seeing platforms as fiduciaries. I think that this is not actually a pre-requirement, and since the rationales are completely aligned here, and uh, since we have uh, the same expectation, I think this should be employed here and insulate platforms from um, judicial intervention as well. We can, you know, in the future, this is just a, a, an initial uh, proposal. In the future, we can think of something like anti-slap uh, procedures, etc., to make this even um, more um, supportive of platforms' uh, free decision making. So, <clears throat> developing the right balance between responsibility and uh, avoiding interference with what is the ongoing operations raises really an ongoing issue, which is individuals versus entities, and the power relationships between individual users and then the platform companies. You mentioned class actions as one possible way to deal with that power imbalance, but I wonder if you can talk more about the degree to which the private law approach assumes equal bargaining power, uh, power partners, which may be lacking. Okay, so first of, first of all, I want to say that relational and contract theory does not assume that. People, some people think it is, but it does not. There may be some very substantial power differences between parties to relational contracts, um, and especially power shifts throughout the relationship. So we can think about, um, it, it's not, um, it doesn't bar the um, analysis, I think. It's not, it's not really a problem. I think that private law, a contract law, let's say, has ways to deal with the collective um, interests, not only through class actions, uh, but we can start seeing, looking, I, I think also Professor Van wrote something uh, about this, um, that users' interests are not limited to their identity as individuals. They, are also, they also include their identity as members of groups or users on the network or as members of the public as a whole, um, which uh, I think are particularly acute when you have a very large platform that can actually induce a lot of harm, create a, um, a lot of, inflict a lot of harm um, to the public as a whole. So I think contract law can definitely weigh in on these considerations and this way kind of balance scales to an extent. It's interesting even to think about the user as speaking for the network of users, and that that's an interest quite separate from them as individuals. So. Yes, I agree, I agree. And I think um, to an extent it's also like that in uh, corporate law, when you have derivative actions, right? Um, where one shareholder can speak on behalf of the corporation or the company as a whole, and other, and they, representing the interests of all shareholders. Um, this, I think, Professor, um, uh, Elkin Koren, um, with a couple of uh, partners, wrote a piece about um, contractual networks and how this manifests into the discussion about social media, where actually one node in the network has the interest of preserving the network as a whole, and this interest should be represented. Right. Maybe coming up in the proposals to limit uh, uh, TikTok because uh, is there a property interest or some other network interest for people to have access to TikTok is already an issue that's being raised. You know, you um, made reference to at least one of the current U.S. Supreme Court cases, and I'm wondering whether if you were given the chance to speak to the court, what would you advise them as they wade into the social media world? Well, specifically in the net choice cases, my, um, let's say, Initial reaction: the, the net choice cases are about common carriage uh, legislation that Texas and Florida has have adopted um, to uh, prevent uh, platforms from uh, discriminating uh, uh, speech based on opinion or uh, based viewpoint. View, viewpoint or um, 
or uh, to take down politicians' um, uh, speech. Uh, I would say that my initial reaction is that I don't want these uh, legislations. This is a contractual issue. If the platform agrees to take certain content, content it should do it, and if it fails to do so, it should uh, be held liable and correct its ways. Right? We do not want the state to start deciding whether this or that uh, discriminate, uh, editorial decision making, let's say, is correct or uh, wrong. And um, the less governmental, direct governmental inter intervention here, I think, uh, the better. Unless, uh, well, maybe that also depends on context and can be nuanced. There are some things that governments can do, like transparency mandates, like procedural mandates, for example. There are some things that we do want the government to intervene in. Uh, and I think, you know, even when we see um, enactments like the DSA, for example, which is very robust, you see that eventually they too try to uh, give platforms space by saying, we want to make sure that you're actually performing the contract that you're uh, suggesting. You know, <clears throat> in many ways, you are focused on some dichotomies, public and private. You're also talking about individual and group. You're also talking about uh, network uh, versus individual. And I, at the same time, you and I have talked about um, it's complementary. These are not either ors. And I wonder if you want to reflect about that. And specifically, you're not saying that private law should replace public law. You think that they can work together. Yeah, I kind of, I, I want to say that private law deserves uh, like a seat at the table. Uh, and to be considered uh, more uh, uh, expansively, or because it has different features to it, it can help us in different context, contexts, and it has different moral underpinnings. And there's absolutely no reason not to put it on the table. I have this concern that this has to do with the sociology behind the um, uh, ac academic kind of environment or the. Um, that people who were very much into freedom of speech and government, governmental work were those inclined into the social media uh, questions. Uh, I don't want to say that uh, uh, too decisively, but I think there's certainly more room to explore the options of private law. I'm going to open it in a minute. I have one more question for you, although I could keep going for many hours here. One more question I have for you is in your discussion of the cautions or concerns at the end, you note that there is a kind of institutional limitation uh, from the private law approach in that it puts the burden on a private actor to initiate. And I'm wondering if in the spirit of your comment a minute ago about the complementarity possibilities of public and private, if we could think about something even like whether it's self-regulation of the Facebook Oversight Board, or it's some role of an administrative agency that is more proactive, but still respectful of these private solutions? Well, that's a hard question. I think, first talking of the Facebook Oversight Board, I think that is a good direction. It's, I don't think it's enough, and I think we need to incentivize that better. The platform judgment rule that I suggested actually tries to incentivize exactly that, saying that uh, platforms can gain immunity if they defer to a, an independent body that makes a decision. Uh, but the, the way the Facebook Oversight Board is currently structured, it's very limited in its powers, so I don't think that's enough, but we want to uh, make that move forward. Uh, so yes, I think that some more um, Public, um, let's say, public intervention is not a bad thing, like necessarily. It just depends on what exactly you are doing and what are the limits of that power. And I'm generally pretty much concerned about things that we're seeing uh, in Europe, um, just because I think you know, once you put on, put, you know, just I'm thinking like a lawyer. They say that lawyers. As a lawyer, you always have to th think about what would happen if this goes wrong, right? What would happen if a liberal government government becomes a um, uh, fascist government? Then you have a lot of power there to deal with. So, in that sense, I think uh, Professor Chander wrote a piece about like the, the DSA would be just what uh, Putin would like to have, 
or something of that sort. And if that's the standard, so it's a problem. So I'm very hesitant about that, but again, I'm trying to offer a different path. I'm trying to give a private law direction that uh, might be uh, helpful. Well, one other version of a kind of hybrid would be a public standard that has safe harbors for private actors that do certain things. So there might be nudges from the public sector that's, that activate. Yeah, I think to an extent this is what Section 230 uh, tried to do, or the, the congressman, uh, Congress, the, the legislator tries tried to do, but uh, the court immediately interpreted it very broadly. So yes, that could be a good nudge. Uh, and again, we should see how the process of common of uh, common law litigation it should have the space to correct itself. But this is like centuries of law, right? of, uh, common law. You, common law starts, and then the legislature corrects and. You go on. Very good. So I'd like to open it up for comments or questions. And if you would, um, just identify yourself when you ask your comment. And I think we have a couple here. Yeah, I sure. Wait for the mic that's coming. Um, thank you. My name is Lisa Austin. I'm a visitor here from the University of Toronto, where I'm law prof. Um, so I really like your approach to looking at the tools of, of private law. I teach private law at, at U of T, and so I do think we, we neglect the set of resources that are there. Um, but I want to push you on a few things here, and it's coming from my other hat being um, as a privacy law scholar, so thinking about technology very much through a different kind of lens. Um, and so a lot of what you were saying, and I know partly it's because you're condensing a complicated set of arguments in a very quick um, uh, general uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, discussion here. But keep talking about the common law and contract law and then opposing it to legislation. And um, um, and I guess in, in the spirit of this kind of what, what, what are these hybrid approaches potentially, there's a lot in private law that's statutory. Intellectual property is created by statute. Corporations are created by statute. Um, property law has loads of statutes in it. Um, so it's not that private law is just common law and judge-made law, um, and then, or we have public law and we impose legislation. It's a much more complicated terrain than that. And why do I think it's important? Because a number of the things that you're pointing to here, like the, the response to Professor Minow's comments about collective interests, where we could have user interests and you know bringing forward their interests as members of groups or whatever, um, you know, there's standing questions there that have like had plagued privacy law um, actions um, in, and so that could be solved through legislation more easily than through test case litigation. You have novel proposals around damages. Um, and again, um, uh, you made some analogies to sort of what happens with corporations. We do a lot of stuff with corporations through statutes. Um, so it seems to me that you could still set up a very contractual-like approach to social media governance, but through legislation that would target some of the potential weaknesses um, of what you want to propose here. And then the other one that I wanted to kind of throw on the table was that a lot of things that you're talking about here presuppose that the individuals bringing those actions are going to have a lot of information, and that's what we don't have. We don't just have power asymmetries, we have information asymmetries. And I think one of the interesting things coming out of some of the proposals like the DSM, um, whatever you think of anything else, is proposals to provide access to, to data. And other people have been proposing whistleblower legislation, better whistleblower um, legislation. People need information. So you have to solve the transparency problem. And it's not clear that you can do that just through litigation. Um, but maybe there could be some kind of other hybrid. Um, so I, I guess I just encourage you to think that you know legislation doesn't necessarily have to be pulling you onto the public side. It can be enhancing the, the private side. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I um, think these are wonderful comments. Uh, for the first comment about the relationship between common law and uh, legislation, I agree uh, completely. I think uh, since, I don't know, for hundreds of years, this is how the law has been developing, including corporate law. Corporate law uh, has started from uh, courts of equity in England, and then the legislature came in and started uh, addressing uh, the, these uh, or the norms that were coming out from the courts and and correcting them. I think to an extent this is also what happened with Section 230, right? It started from bad common law, and the Congress Congress intervened to make it better, right? To correct the incentive structure that was created. 
so I think this is necessary, but I think there is a specific problem here, which is the First Amendment that prevents uh, a legal uh, direct intervention by the government uh, in many respects, not all of them. But to going to the next, the second comment, I think um, yes, the DSM like transparency requirements, all of these uh, operations that that is great. I agree with, I support that, and I think these are, these are again. Um, tools that are complementary. They're not, I, I don't think they're substitutionary, unless, again, there's a specific constraint that doesn't allow public law to intervene, or if we really don't want it to intervene, intervene for other reasons. As you know, I think this is a terrific project. Say who you are, Rory. Rory Van Lu, Boston University. And you're absolutely right that the public emphasis is missing from the platform governance conversations. But it's counterintuitive that you need to make the move that you do in this paper, which is a contribution, um, in the sense that the early platform governance scholarship was very anti-regulation, if you will, almost libertarian. Uh, based on this belief that this decentralized mass of users and platforms would figure it out through private ordering and, and contracts, right? Then a wave of more public-founded, if you will, public-oriented scholarship appeared almost in response to that early private ordering scholarship, if you will, and the pendulum swung the other direction. But your scholarship it, both in this paper and, as I understand it, where it's going, really kind of unearths, if you will, some of the, the public duties that one can find in private law, and that's one of the rich elements of it. And so I, I would just be interested in hearing you speak a little bit more, whether based on your own scholarly arc or the broader conversations, uh, whether there's this, like, how do you situate this one within that arc. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so I think that this approach, I, I, have, I have a friend who uh, read the paper and he said, well, of course I don't agree with it because this is kind of conservative because it appear, uh, appeals to courts and the, that is the conservative move. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's a conservative move. I think offering to impose duties on uh, private corporations to respect the public interest, that's one, some uh, radical move. Uh, and I think in this con specific context, it's particularly correct. And uh, to address your comment, I think private law since always had private public considerations uh, embedded in it. I think something went wrong to an extent. I think contract law needs to adapt, like it has always been doing. And I think the reality creates pressure on judges to start moving in that direction. And I think we're seeing that right now. We're seeing courts struggling. What do we do with Section 230? How do we intervene in what's, what's going on here? And they can't find the right way to do it. And I'm trying to an extent this paper is, uh, its audience are judges and litigators. I want them to start moving this forward and use the resources infinite resources of common law or private law in this direction. Again, like I uh, replied, I think this is, the, it's a, it has always been like a question of harmonizing private and public action, right? Of part, private and public law. And I think this is a minor contribution in that direction uh, that I think we should all aspire to uh, generally. I'm gonna just jump in here and say, <clears throat> that I think that uh, your resistance to a sharp dichotomy is really an asset here. Because the way in which we artificially describe private law and public law help, prevents people from seeing an iterative process of developing norms that actually bridges those two. And you are unabashedly and always eager to talk about big values and the values are there the values are reinforced then by government enforcement so even a private contract reflects public enforcement thank you for saying that better than me but 
Um, my name is Matilda. I am a marketing scholar. I work in the uh, in business school. And many of these aspects uh, here have been very heavily uh, investigated in marketing discipline from the relational norms uh, uh, to how do we protect consumers, etc. So my question to you and Marta, if you can, if you can comment, how is this, this is more like explanation to me, how is this different than consumer protection laws? And we know that they haven't been very successful in really protecting consumers. And as a European, of course, my, my second question to you is, what about uh, laws of protecting against harm? I'm not a lawyer, so this is more trying to understand how, this, how these different laws actually fit together. Because we do have many different aspects in common, from the trust to consumer protection, to privacy protection, etc. Thank you. Um, OK, thank you very much. I think, first of all, uh, I don't think the final word has been said about product liability claims that are uh, litigated as we speak in the United States. Um, for example, there is a big lawsuit kind of litigated right now about children's safety. Um, that could have uh, contributions. Tort law and contract law have different um, assumptions, but the line is not very distinct very often, right? When uh, platforms provide a service, we can say this is a fraudulent misrepresentation that de deserves some uh, consumer law kind of uh, tort law uh, redress. Or we can say this is a contractual a breach of contract. Litigators talking both voices constantly. Right? The question is, what is, um, I, you know, it's not, again, not an either or, it's both. The question is, what, what are the limitations of each, each method, right? So I think contract law gives us um, more respect to voluntarily uh, assumed obligations, which is crucial, I think, in the context of speech. Product liability, again, could be very efficient when you're talking about uh, children's safety, creating an addictive product, for example, um, which ir irrespectful of, irrespective of what uh, content is there on the platform, but it just creates addiction that creates harm that needs to be redressed, I think, uh, product liability uh, lawsuits could uh, prevail on that, um, but also I think a, contra a contractual liability based on an, a concept of fairness, based on a concept that platforms actually need to consider children's interests when they are operating. Right. Um, once we say that, we can we and it, like you come from marketing, right? So platforms they have to give these uh, representations. They have to create uh, this reputation, otherwise people wouldn't be on the platform, right? So I think this is an important reservation. I think uh, Professor Balkin had it uh, about the contractual approach to social media uh, governance. He said, well, platforms can simply change, change the contract, right? So I don't think they simply can, because there, there are market concerns. Uh, and especially if you take away, step away from the idea that this is just the terms and conditions, and you start exposing all the norms and expectations that flow into this contract, you see that they have to consider. They have to consider children's, um, children's and users generally um, interests as well. So one of the most powerful parts of your analysis, and you just touched on it, is to expose that the relationship uh, established by contract is not simply the what's reduced to a term of service. It's a rich uh, contribution of all the communications that are coming. And that actually is a way I begin to answer your question. It's a good one. <clears throat> the consumer protection law has not been entirely, not been very successful at all. And yet, if we understand that the consumer uh, relationship is not just the thin contract, but the entire set of relationships that are established, especially where it's ongoing, as it is with social media, it can be a much thicker body of duties uh, than we have when you buy a toaster. Now, when you buy the toaster, though, there is tort law that is also possible. So I think understanding that there are multiple tools is helpful. Nonetheless, I come back to you about the power imbalance and resource imbalance. I think it came up before. If there is a, a body of norms, but there aren't the resources to actually enforce them, should there be an obligation on the platform companies to contribute to 
a trust fund that can subsidize the development of private law enforcement? I don't think you can find such a duty through uh, a private law approach. This is a uh, public law imposition, which um, as an initial response, I don't have reservation against. I think I actually tend to support it. Um, and I think, yes, I think we can think a lot about how do we bridge this uh, power asymmetry? How do we create uh, easier processes um, to address uh, harm? Um, this could be an online court. It could be mandates, procedural mandates. Uh, it could be many things. And the, again, this is kind of a first step in what should start happening now. Courts starting to intervene and, and kind of weighing in on what platforms are actually doing, but in a very cautious manner, so as not to replace their judgment, I think. You, you know, you referred to the origins of corporate law in, in the courts of equity, which of course, even previously prior to that time, really are about royal power, royal prerogative. And I think that we would do ourselves some service by recognizing that there is a privilege being given to companies to be able to access the market. And if you, it doesn't have to be this royal edict, it is in a democracy, it is a privilege that the people give. But there are reciprocal obligations that come from that privilege. I, uh... Tend to agree. Okay. Well, I think we're coming to the end of our time. Thank you all for participating. Please join me in the